Hello, and welcome to Insightful Conversations with your host, Three Principles Practitioner, Del A.D. Jones. Join her each week as she welcomes some of the world's leading Three Principles teachers and practitioners who share how this understanding has dramatically improved the quality of their lives and the lives of those they work with. I'm so thrilled to have Andrea Morrison with me today. Andrea is a transformational coach, mentor, writer, and speaker. She works with professionals and entrepreneurs, enabling them to understand how they create their experience so that they can free their innate potential and let go of what is holding them back. Welcome, Andrea. I'm so thrilled that you're with us today. And we've been talking about this for quite a while now, well over a year. (laughs) So, um, so. I listened to your TED talk and I thought it was fabulous. And I want you to tell the our listeners um, how you made the journey from barrister through a reflexologist to now being an executive coach. So fill us in on that, please. Yeah, okay. Well, how long have we got? We've got several days, haven't we? To like, <laughs> yeah. that in real detail. <laughs> well, I came to um, the bar quite late. Uh, I didn't retrain until I was in my late 20s. Um, I'd had another career. I'd been to failing schools and met my husband really young, but it was a dream I'd always had. Like, I knew that, that I was going to be a barrister. I knew I had it in me. And that was really quite bizarre and quite risky because at the time, only I think it was 11% of barristers were women in the UK and and I think the year that I did my law degree like 50,000 students did law you know I mean like the chances of me becoming a barrister was so minute it was it it was ridiculous it was a, a a silly risk to take really but I just knew that's what I had to do so that's what we did and I went back to university and um studied law got the grades I needed and got tenant, what we call tenancy in, in York, uh, which was a fabulous chambers. And, and I was probably about 31 at that point. And so you would think, oh, well, now she's got everything that she's ever wanted. This was like her dream. And it was my dream job. I loved it. But running alongside of that, um, I had an infertility story as well. I have a condition called endometriosis and that had always kind of plagued my life at that time. That's how I saw it. And um, and we were told, you know, you, you're going to have to get on with this because otherwise you're going to run into difficulties. And anyway, we did run into difficulties and it took us a couple of years to, to fall pregnant. And eventually uh, we had my daughter and everything kind of changed then for me because you know I you know I, I had this beautiful human being that we were told we weren't going to have and and here she was and and then very in very quick succession I had my son so there's only 15 months between the two of them and then I had my daughter my youngest daughter two years later so we ended up with three children in three years <laughs> which was just nuts so we never do anything by halves <laughs> we, we always got to go over the top with these things mm-hmm. and and so life like family life was really beautiful and my job was going really well at that point so I I'd gone back to work and um and you know as a barrister but I'd gone back full time I was working ridiculous hours and my practice was all over the UK and And I suppose what, when I look back now, I can see all the stories in my mind that I'd had for so many years. You know, I was told at the age of 13 that people like me didn't do jobs like this. You know, I I, I had to set my sights a lot lower than that. And, And whilst that was done in kindness, when I was there 20 years later, it was like, I shouldn't be here. You know, I had such imposter syndrome. It was incredible. And, and that started to kind of knock my confidence. I began to kind of work even harder to try to prove myself. Um, I thought everybody was better than me. Um, I didn't think I was a very good parent. You know, I wasn't present when I was with my kids. I wasn't present at work. I was, you know, if I could beat myself up over something, then I could. And, 
And I think with that and the toll of having like three kids at home, you know, very young children and not sleeping and not really looking after myself because I was putting myself at the bottom of the list with all of these um, self-doubt and confidence and not really liking myself very much and, and all of that that was going on. Eventually, I started to um, exhibit the signs of kind of burnout, if you like. But I mean, I didn't notice them at all. So it kind of started with, you know, the feeling of anxiousness, the always getting ill and having coughs and colds and things like that, and just generally feeling very run down. You know, my, you know, my back ached. I had all these signals in my in my body that I was just kind of ignoring. Um, and eventually I ended up with pneumonia in about 11 years ago now. Mm. And I look back now and I think, you know, that should have been a wake up call, but it like just wasn't. I, I, I'd gone to the, I can remember I got gone to the doctors on the Friday, was told, and it's, it's weird how your wisdom kind of works because it, it told me I had to go to, I had to be seen. And actually I was really sick, really sick. And, but within a week, I was back at my desk working, you know. Oh my God, I can't even imagine. I mean, it's it's hard enough being a a parent to children that are spaced out, but having three under the age of four and a full-time job, it must have been insane. And it was insane. And the thing was, is that I can look back and just think, what on earth was I thinking? But the thing was, is that I wasn't even aware that I was creating this like I just felt I had no choice in this whatsoever like you know I'd I, I I couldn't stop work because I had a family you know and I was the main breadwinner you know and I, I I couldn't give all of this up because I'd asked my husband to move to the other end of the country for me to you know pursue my career so I couldn't then just give it up you know in my mind this was a huge thing you know but of course (laughs) as always it it boils down to quite a simple decision but at the time it it really didn't feel like that so I'd I kind of stumbled for like another well probably about another eight months and then I started having panic attacks I started getting really anxious and really low in my mood and I just thought I had to stop so I took the decision that I would take a sabbatical fully expecting that I would go back when I just had a break and um, initially I did some tutoring at a university and and they introduced me to this idea of mindset well I'd never come across anything like this before I mean this was just like what you mean like you know you can do something about this (laughs) you know know, sadly it wasn't three principles but it was you know it started me on a on a journey of being curious if you like and but at the same time my body had just completely packed up so within six months of me being on sabbatical I had full-blown chronic fatigue um so that impacted me physically hugely you know I, I couldn't walk very far I was sleeping a lot I mean my body literally just came to a stop um and so again. as you were not listening it had to do something to have you pay attention Oh my goodness, it couldn't have shouted any louder, believe me. Um, Yeah, and I just, I wasn't listening at all to it. Um, And and it's interesting how then I fell back into reflexology because when I was having, when we were trying to have my daughter, I'd I'd come across a lady who sat next to me in a yoga lesson who just trained in reflexology and I was sharing with her, she lived in my village, she was sharing with her what was going on. And she said, well, I've just trained in reflexology, let me have a go on your feet. Mm-hmm. And by this time we tried everything. We were on the IVF list, you know, we've been told we probably wouldn't get IVF, you know, and, and all of that that you're warned about. And I thought, wow, well, you know, it's not gonna do any harm. <laughs> and then fell pregnant, like after two sessions. So. I'd had this incredibly positive experience of reflexology and after about 14 months of being off work I I started having this this thought if you like well just look up reflexology just go and look up reflexology just have a look at it you know go and train in it or and it just made no sense I mean I was a lawyer (laughs) it was 
when does that happen you know <laughs> at the time I mean I was really quite poorly and and I felt I really needed to do something just for me like that that wasn't anything for anybody else I just had this you know this yearning for that and so I ended up signing up to a course for reflexology. And it was a really big step for me because I had to go there for a day um, in a place called Sheffield, which was about an hour away from me and I had to drive. So even that, I had thinking about that, you know, like, could I stay in the car long enough for an hour? You know, was I going to stay awake? Could I concentrate for that amount of time? You know, because obviously I was still quite sick, but I managed it. And so when I qualified, I, I was really excited. <laughs> And I'm really chuffed with myself because to me that was like quite a huge achievement. And and I, I don't think I ever really thought beyond that. You know, I, I was just doing the course and I thought, well, then I'd get treatments every week and and that would be really cool. And alongside that, I'd also been introduced to things like NLP and hypnotherapy and, and different other kind of techniques if you like to try and sort out what was going on in my head because I could see that th this wasn't really doing me any favors at that time and and so that was kind of quite an interesting kind of coming together of those those two things so I decided that I would stop my little part-time job at the university and I would set up a reflexology practice in my home because I thought well I could be you know, I could be at home with the kids and I was still getting really stressed. Like my, my husband used to say, you could get stressed opening a packet of crisps. I mean, it was just ridiculous <laughs> how, how easily I could just get stressed and frustrated about something. So I thought, well, you know, th this isn't going to be stressful, right? You know, because people are going to come to my home. I'm going to do reflexology on their feet. They're going to be mostly asleep. It's just going to be really calming. Like everything about it is going to be calming. Well, I could make that stressful <laughs> as I found out mm. I still had I still had stories about um you know I wasn't good enough so I had to be even better and you know I had to be the best reflexologist and I had to be busy and it had to work and I would mm. put those pictures on but I, I love what you shared in the TED talk about that you know a client could leave and be totally happy with the treatment and you'd walk into the kitchen to make yourself a cup of tea. And within half an hour, you'd convinced yourself you're the worst reflexologist ever. Totally. She wasn't in the kitchen with you. <laughs> totally. Absolutely. I had such a warped view of how I presented to the world. I mean, it, it really was, you know, and I look back now with such compassion to to that that poor lady who struggles with with just with just life you know because I I looked at everything through this lens of not being good enough mm. and 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 you know not yeah not coming quite up to the mark and right. failing and um yeah and how could I do better and that was such an enormous pressure that I just and it didn't matter how many times People would say, I remember one counsellor, oh, that was when I was at the bar, got me to write down all the nice things that people said about me. And it didn't matter a, a bit. I'd write it down and think, well, they didn't really mean it. You know, I, would, I wouldn't even believe it when people said it to me. You know, that lens was so strong, so I, strong that I looked. Through. I can identify with that one so, so well. Um, it, and it's amazing that we, that we live our life in that suffering as, as you said, I, I have the same, I have such compassion for my younger self that, that I unknowingly and innocently caused, you know, so much pain and suffering with that, that voice just saying, you're not good enough, you couldn't, you know, get another qualification, do something else, that then you'll get confidence. So I love that you address this and you point people in this direction of, of where confidence really does come from. So how did, I'm curious, I know you said you did NLP and things, how did you come across the principles? What was the <laughs> pivotal oh, moment for you? Random thing in my life, <laughs> that there's a theme yeah. here. So I, um, 
I actually wrote a book called The Feel Good Factor, which was just based on my experience. I mean, I had no coaching qualification. I mean, and when I, it, it, in some ways I'm a little embarrassed, but in the other ways, I think it was such a beautiful book because it literally, so much of it just came from wisdom, you know, and it was so straightforward, the things that I was doing to help myself. And, and when I went to launch that, so that was in January 2014, I was sharing this with a friend and she'd come and, and she lives in Scotland and she said, oh, hey, you should come and listen to this guy speak. And, and it was it was Ali Campbell. And and you should come because I think you'd really like his stuff, you know, and, and I had no idea who he was, you know, absolutely no idea. And, and so I went up to, to Glasgow in, in the January for one of his days. And I sat there and I was just like, I, I need to work with this guy. I need to do his course. Now, that was like this knowing inside of me. And I remember the conversation with my husband so clearly because I, I said, this makes no sense. This has got nothing to do with I'm do what, what I'm doing now. I have no idea where this is going to fit, but I need to do this course. And it's eight or nine days but it's okay I'm gonna stay with my friend it's gonna be okay I mean you know I was asking him to look after the kids for like three two weeks on his own for no reason and this is just how amazing he is because he was just like yeah sure, go ahead if you feel you need to do it go do it that's cool <laughs> and so I went and I did his NLP course but at that time he'd um, just finished working or had recently finished working with Michael Neal and he kept talking about these principles and and, and it was just something about, about it, you know, it, it, it just really kind of, that was the bit that really resonated with me. Whilst I enjoyed the NLP stuff, it was the principles conversation that really kind of drew me in. And it just made so much sense. Mm. You, know, the, the, you know, especially in what my first insight was, oh, you know, I, I, I don't have to believe everything I think. Oh. <laughs> yes. <laughs> everything that I thought like everything you know and yeah. and just knowing that that thought isn't as reliable as I thought it was and that it was transient and it was changeable and well it just kind of comes and goes in my head and you know I, I didn't have to pay attention if I did I mean I didn't realize I could discriminate against different thoughts before and I just yeah. paid attention to all of it yeah and and he, he recommended some books on the course and I, and I came away and I read Michael Neal's Inside Out Revolution. And I was just blown away by that. And then I read um, How Good Can You Sound It by Thomas Kelly. Mm -hmm. And I was, again, every time I was just like, I mean, I just couldn't get enough. It was just like, this is making so much sense to me. And I just went from one book to the other. I remember reading the relationship Hamburg and it just like my I just felt like my head was exploding every time I read one of these books and I and I just couldn't put the conversation down so I was I mean I didn't have a coaching practice until a year later is when I opened it but it didn't matter what I did whether I was doing hypnotherapy or NLP or EFT or whatever I'd end up having a principles conversation <laughs> so just wouldn't leave me alone <laughs> that's so great I, I and you know what's so funny is because I think that was the same thing not having to believe all you know all my insecure thoughts they had sort of set up shop camped out in my head for so many years I just thought they were just informing me about who I was you know or, and all my faults I have no idea that I didn't have to pay attention to it either that was so liberating for me as well. I know. It's just incredible, isn't it? It, it just really is. And, and I think what, what I love about them is just the gentleness about them. Yeah. You know, the fact that, well, okay, if you believe it, that's okay. We all do that too. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, anything. You know, I think when, especially when I first came to personal development, and of course, I had no background at all. I had no experience in personal development. It was almost like I was aiming for this perfect mindset, you know, where I had no negative thoughts in my head, nothing that would upset me or disturb me or anything like that, you know. And 
And so I just kept messing it up. You know, I wasn't good enough. So, you know, I still had that kind of tape of you like running in my head because I can't even do this properly. You know what I mean? Like, you know, and of course, then you tell yourself that everybody else is, you know, enlightened and having all these massive insights. I couldn't do that. And I think what I, what I loved when I looked in this direction even more is that, oh, do you know what? That's okay too. We all do that. Exactly. I love it too. I I was on a spiritual path for and and a therapy path and a self-help path for so many years. And it was always the, the, the striving to get to a level where, um, you know, I, I didn't feel these things or didn't experience, you know, pain, suffering, insecurity, whatever. And I love what you're saying. And it is the beauty of the principles is it's like, oh, no, that still happens. You just don't take it seriously. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, me too. I still get, you know, caught up. And it's like, oh, but that I mean, that is so liberating for me. It's just and, and I love how we all sort of like, you know, bear our souls to each other and laugh hysterically at our humanness and, and how many times we fall asleep and wake up again and it's all OK. It's so lovely. It's just, um, yeah, just incredible. Well, I, I think that's right, because I think we we do kind of have these kind of suggestions or the, the way we're brought up that there's something wrong with all of that. Mm-hmm. And so it needs fixing. We need to kind of somehow get rid of it, if you like, you know, remove it, you know. And so we spend a whole lifetime trying to do that. <laughs> and it's like, it's just a pointless exercise <laughs> in many ways, you know, because it, it is, it's kind of part of who we are. You know? Exactly. I know. And in so many spiritual traditions, there is that sort of risk of a spiritual bypass and a and a, and, a, and a looking at your human side as, as less than. And whereas what I love about the principles is like, no, we're everything. But, you know, we're the form and the formless. And yeah. this lovely, quirky human part of us is just a wonderful little expression of, of our divine essence. But we're not trying to um, get rid of it, which yeah. I, I just love. It's just gives you so, it lightens everything up. Everything becomes more fun. Even when, even when you get caught up in, in negative thinking, it's that relationship with, her, it's, with it. It's just like, oh, God, I did it again. Well, that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, hey. really? I got caught up in that for how long? <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know, and it is, it's just, oh. Oh, and I look back and I took myself so seriously. I mean, I still do take myself seriously. But like I took myself so seriously, <laughs> I took it to a whole new level. <laughs> it, was, you know, it was quite funny, really. <laughs> but I didn't know any better. <laughs> so it's, it's exactly. All right. And it's my favorite three pr- principles. Word is innocent. It's like we innocently do these things, and because I used to feel so um, guilty if I wasn't good enough. And when you look at it, it's just like, no, it's just an innocent misunderstanding. You And everybody's doing the best they can with their thinking in the moment. And if we knew better, we'd do better. It's just, it's just a loving, beautiful acceptance. So your husband sounds like an absolute saint. So you, you went from being a barrister to a reflexologist to being an NLP and a and and so now you you work with um, businesses and executives and entrepreneurs. I do, I do, and 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 it's just it's just lovely. It's just a dream, you know. Occupy. I don't even want to call it a job because I don't actually feel like I'm working half the time. You know, it's just having these lovely conversations and and just waking people up to who they really are and I I just I mean maybe it's not the right thing to say but I just love that part when when you just see you know a a penny drop in someone or they go and do something that they didn't think they were able to do before or life just starts to unfold for them in ways that they just couldn't possibly imagine and and yeah I, I, I just love that that's just the best bit you know and but I, what I love about it is, is that that's the understanding. You know, it, it, it's not even anything to do with me. I'm just introducing them to how they work, you know, and then they do the rest. You know, it's just, yeah, it's just lovely. It really is. Yeah, I, I feel the same. I mean, gosh, when, it, when I have clients that are, are you know, suffering and, and, and 
you know, I, I see myself, I see how many years that I suffered and how many years I lived in this little sort of um, torturous box that I created for myself. And, and, um, and then just what's possible when you just let go of that. Yeah. It's incredible. So is, is your husband, does your husband um, understand this principle? Or he just witnessed the change in you and by osmosis? How, how does that work? How can I put this? So um, he he just is the understanding, but he probably doesn't know it. Mm -hmm. And I recognize it for a long time. So, you know, he he has always been somebody who's kind of gone with the flow. He's totally unflappable. He he kind of goes with what he feels is right. He he doesn't overthink things. He's just always been that kind of guy. Whereas I was the, the kind of Yorkshire Terrier version of somebody who did life, you know, <laughs> so like yapping and jumping up and down and just, you know, and, and he was just like, yeah, sort of like the, the kind of Great Dane kind of character, you know, just kind of just there. Um, and, and he's kind of interested. So he does kind of um, look in this direction and he, he listens to podcasts and things like that. And, and we'll have different conversations and, and it's just, yeah, it's just lovely. It's just been incredible. And I think in terms of, you know, how he has been supportive, it's just been really just holding that space without, in, there's never been any judgment there, which I just think is is beautiful. You know, there's never been any, you should do this or you should do that. It's always, he's just hold, held that space for me. Which and is, I love what you're pointing to is that, you know, this isn't something we learn it's not something that we get and then use. It's something that's always happening. We just a lot of us, as you say, inherently come from that place. And then there's some of us that are just so distracted with looking over here to sort of get it from outside of ourselves. But it's always present. It's always been there. We just some of us got a little hijacked along the way and started looking in the wrong direction. But um, again, that's that's just such an innocent byproduct of, of being human. So what are you, what's coming up for you? What, what, what I know that you're doing, um, you do a lot of work with women's, women groups as well. Is that right? Uh, that's right. So um, working with women is something I've always been really passionate with, mainly because obviously I am a woman and, you know, I think a lot of women identify with, with the challenges that, that I went through, if you like, and, and the challenges that we face as women. And, and I've always been quite keen to, I have a, a principles-based program just for women. And actually this year, I was really fortunate to be able mm -hmm. to be involved with a number of organizations and um, listen to them about the challenges that they thought were going on for women in, particularly female entrepreneurs, but also women in the workplace. Yeah. And, and interestingly, at the beginning of the year, I'd started talking to a number of different women. I just put out a, a, a thing on, um, on my social media. And I'd had about 20, 25 conversations and, and the women that I'd spoken to were like, <clears throat> excuse me, um, well, actually, could we have like a retreat, but not like an overnight retreat, somewhere where we could come and then we'd go home and do family stuff and then come back the next day, but do it in a, a short burst. And I thought, yeah, we could do that. And, and I'd managed to find, well, not managed to find, this venue kind of just fell into my lap as these things do. And it was all unfolding beautifully. <laughs> And then, of course, the pandemic hit. Yes. <laughs> um, like, oh, okay. Well, maybe we're not doing that then. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting because it had surprised me what these women were saying, that they wanted a, a retreat because my feeling was that we were going, I was going to be doing an online program. That was what I had in my mind. And when I'd spoken mm -hmm. to... Um, people like like I'd had a conversation with uh, 3PRC you know to do some research mm -hmm. in it and 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 I talked about an online program you know without really thinking about it and then of course the pandemic hit and um and I just put it all on the back burner because I thought I'm just going to support my clients I don't I, I wasn't sure how I could be of best service because everything was already up in the air and um and then out of the blue, our, our local authority had some money 
to help local businesses. And a colleague of mine said, you should apply for a grant. You should apply for this. And, and I thought, oh, well, I suppose that would help. We could get this online program on, you know, the online program that I wasn't going to do that, you know, in my head, it was not going to happen, you know. And I just found myself, you know, applying for this for this funding and putting together a bid and then we got the funding for it and it was like okay so we're really doing this thing then this is kind of great so oh, fabulous it, it was just it fine was, timing <laughs> yeah but it was lovely just to watch it kind of unfold and and also I think as an entrepreneur in the principles really really allowing it to unfold and not hold because usually I hold things like this like 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 a child holds a baby hamster you know <laughs> I kind of squeeze it and I want it so much and I want it to work and I want it to be right and everything and I, I squeeze the life out of it yeah and, and so I was I was really conscious of the feeling that I was in when I was kind of planning and and doing the next step and 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 there was a lot of kind of pulling not kind of pulling back or stepping back really mm -hmm. and just yeah. allowing it to unfold and so that's that's where I'm at at the moment we started yesterday oh, and we wonderful. Had beautiful eight-week program yeah. so that's great wonderful well unfortunately we're coming to the end of our time but um um so if you offer this again I'm sure other people that are listening would love to know about it so can you give your website and how people can contact you to work with you Absolutely. So my website is andreamorrison.co.uk. And if you go there, then there's all the links to my social media. So you can find me on Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and Twitter, whichever the, the <laughs> one you want to use most. <laughs> but you oh. can find me on there too. Oh, that's wonderful. I love that. And I know it's it's this pandemic is, you know, affected all, all of us in very different ways. But fortunately, as coaches, we can still we can still be very effective via Zoom. So it's- yeah, um, I just feel very blessed. Very blessed that I have three teenagers, but I never thought I'd say that. And very blessed that we have, um, you know, I have this facility as well because uh, I've just been able to work, which is just brilliant. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I know it's late for you over there. So um, enjoy your evening, the rest of your evening. And it's lovely seeing you again. Oh, Thank you so much for having me, Dad. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for listening to the show. If you're interested in learning more about my coaching and mentoring packages, please reach out to me at deladyjones at gmail.com. I would love to hear from you.